this path we're practicing has a lot of right factors. In fact, it's fairly clearly delineated so you know what's right and what's wrong. We're always trying to be right. To act rightly. It's an important distinction, though. You want to act rightly. As far as being right, there are dangers in being right because you build up an identity around it. And that can get you into trouble. There's a wrong way to be right and a right way to be right. Act rightly. So you want to make sure that you're right in the right way. It's like a suit of clothes. You want it to be well cut so it fits you rightly, but you want to wear it casually. If you're afraid that the clothes are going to get soiled, you never can wear them. If you're uptight about the clothes, there's no comfort in wearing them. And John Cha has a nice story about three men going into the woods and they hear a rooster crow. And two of them decide to play a game with the other one. And they say, what do you think, is that a rooster or a chicken? And the other one says, well, of course it's a rooster. The other two say, no, we think it's a chicken. They're teasing him, and he gets all upset. No matter how much he tries to argue with them, they have sharp replies. He ends up crying, because he can't get them to admit the truth. That's one way of being right but wrong, just getting really upset when you're dealing with other people who will not admit that they're wrong. There's another Ajahn Chah story about a famous monk in Thailand. One of Ajahn Chah's students went to stay with a monk. He noticed that that particular monk's monastery, the, the venue, was extremely lax. So they asked the famous monk about it. He said, well, Really, the essence of the vinaya is to be mindful, so we just practice mindfulness here. So the student went back and reported this to John Cha. He said, well, he's right, but he's wrong. The vinaya is about being mindful, but it's about a lot more as well. And the rules are there to help you be careful about how you're acting, so that you don't act in ways that are unskillful, that you might not see as unskillful at the time, but as you get to live in the community, you begin to see that these rules really do help protect you from a lot of disharmony. I notice this myself. For all the work I've done in the vineyard, I have to admit that when I first read the rules, I was not all that eager to live a life under the rules. But then I began to appreciate that as you Live with lots of people from lots of different backgrounds, it's good to have a clear set of rules as to what's right and what's wrong. Then you try to hold very clearly to what's right. But you don't want to hold so closely the fact that you start getting down on other people's behavior and start thinking that you're better than they are. This element of pride is the big problem. The Buddha saw this in his practice of austerities. He realized that sensual passions were not the way, so he figured out it had to be the other way, the other extreme. So he went to the extreme of self-torture. For six years he underwent all kinds of self-afflicted tortures. And you have to ask yourself, what could keep a person going in cases like that? And it's pride. And when he finally realized that this, that path was not working, he was able to overcome his pride. That's one of the more inspiring parts of the story. He thought he'd been right. He thought there were only two alternatives, and this was obviously the right of the two. It was when he was able to open his mind, well, maybe there's more out there more than just these two alternatives, and he realized it was his pride that was getting in the way of letting go of that practice. So 
was able to let go of the pride, and that was what enabled him to get on the path that was genuinely right. So you have to look at your rightness. Is it a rightness that involves pride? Is it a rightness that involves the mental subterfuges of that the John who was saying that all you have to do is be mindful? Is it a rightness that's getting you upset when you're dealing with other people? If it's any of those types of rightness, it's wrong. It's not helping you on the path, creating a lot of burdens for yourself. So it's good to open your mind to other dimensions. And Jean Mahabhava mentioned this in one of his Dharma talks. And he was very strict about the practice of not eating any food that he didn't get on his own alms round. And he noticed other monks in the monastery who started out the rains retreat with that vow, and then one by one by one they dropped away. Was he going to drop away? No. And there was an element of pride there, and John Mun saw that. And so once or twice during the rains retreat he would slip a little something into John Mahabhu's bowl. And the John Mahabhu realized, okay, there's more to the practice than just being right or sticking to your vows. Sometimes it would be food from people who came late, they didn't get there in time to put food in the monks' bowls. You had to show, show some compassion for them. He didn't do it often, just once every now and then, to make a John Mahabhu think. You could look all around you at what you're doing to see what aspects of your rightness are wrong. It's so easy as we practice, when we get something right, to forget that a lot of our rightness comes from other people, the people who've carried the Dharma along, transmitted the Dharma all these many, many centuries. And it's good to be willing to listen to them, because they have a lot to teach. One of the most unfortunate aspects of American Dharma is the idea that, well, the Asians did a pretty sloppy job. They managed to keep some of the Dharma alive, but they missed a lot of the points, and we're going to get it right this time. And that kind of attitude closes the doors to all kinds of good lessons that can come from really listening to the tradition, from really submitting yourself to the tradition. It's one of the reasons why we chant, to remind ourselves, okay, there's a long line of ideas, attitudes that have been passed on, and they've been passed on because they're valuable. And it's good to get them in our, our, our heads and our hearts. So the conversation inside the head is not just our different voices. We're adding some new voices to make us look at things in a different way, to open a little air into the closed room of our opinions. It's always good to reflect on the fact that we are part of a long chain. The people have been trying to practice the Dharma and benefit from the Dharma. And we want to be able to pass it on intact. This is how we repay our debt of gratitude to those who kept the Dharma alive all these many centuries. I was reading a passage written by someone who was talking about how to read the suttas. And they say, you know, choose the suttas that resonate with you, and also read some ones that you don't like. Go back to them again. Figure what it is you don't like about them. And instead of looking for the problem in them, look at the problem in yourself. This is how we grow. So we try to act rightly, but as for being right, put that aside.
And you find yourself building a little pride upon, around being, right? Remind yourself, you owe a lot to the people who went before. And so when you are right, when you've got something right, show some gratitude to them. For without them, we'd be nowhere. <laughs>